Welcome to the Grind It Podcast. You know, life can be such a grind at times, and so we're here sharing God's Word with you to encourage you to keep grinding and to not give up. It's time to grind. So here's the host of the Grind It Podcast, the old school skateboarder himself, Randall Tucker. Welcome to the Grind It Podcast. Today we're going to finish up Matthew chapter 4. And just as a quick review of the book of Matthew, Oh, you know, we have the genealogy in chapter 1. Uh, and then John the baptizer uh, has paved the way uh, for Jesus the Messiah. He has been out in the Judean wilderness preaching to people that they should repent of their sins. And he was baptizing them in the river Jordan for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. And people were coming out to hear John and the religious leaders get wind of it. And they want to come out and hear John. He kind of scolds them a little bit. But crowds upon crowds was coming to hear John's message, and they were not only hearing the message, but they were obeying uh, the message. And one day, as John's out there baptizing people, up walks Jesus. And, and John's like, whoa, dude, what are you doing? I mean, I should be baptized by you. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And uh, John, uh, then Jesus has no permit this. This is God's will. Uh, this is to fulfill all righteousness. Which means, basically, that Jesus is saying, I'm here to kick off my ministry, and this is how it's going to get started. And so, Jesus is baptized by John the baptizer in the Jordan River, not for the remission of sins, but to fulfill our righteousness and to kick off his ministry. And immediately, he is sent, Jesus is sent, or or led by the Spirit into the wilderness, right? Where he's fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. And during that time, the devil comes along and tempts Jesus uh, three different ways. And we know uh, uh, that this is just the same thing that the, the devil tried to use in the garden on Adam and Eve. It's the same things that he uses uh, against us today. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And we can defeat him just like Jesus did with the word of of God. And so we come to the second part of Matthew chapter 4. And Matthew tells us that Jesus starts his ministry. And he says, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, see all these details, where so many Gentiles lived, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near, or many translations say, has come. <clears throat> the same exact message that John the baptizer had. John has been arrested at this time. He had uh, been condemning uh, Herod for uh, marrying his sister. And um, he's eventually going to be uh, beheaded while he is in prison. And he's going to actually question Jesus. And we'll get to that at, at some point, I'm sure. Because he he's... You know, he's at the point of death and he's thinking, are you really the one? And Jesus tells John disciples, you go tell John, I'm the one. So not to worry, he'll be taken care of. So Jesus has been hanging out in Judea. He returns to Galilee and the first place that he goes is Nazareth, which is his home town. Remember, I believe it was uh, uh Nathaniel, uh, Philip's friend, that says, could any good thing come from Nazareth? So Nazareth was was not well looked upon <clears throat> as a, a town, as a city in, in, in and around uh, where Jesus ministered. Um, but Jesus goes to Nazareth, his hometown, then he goes to Capernaum, And this was all to fulfill a prophecy which comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. But I want to point something out about this prophecy, or that it's in this prophecy, uh, that I believe that's interesting. 
when the prophecy says this fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in Galilee where so many Gentiles live. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Now this would be the first mention of Gentiles. <clears throat> and it comes from a prophecy about the Messiah. And the reason it's interesting to me is because of the statement that Jesus made himself in Matthew chapter 15 verse 24 to a Gentile woman whose daughter who was possessed by a demon that was tormenting her and she wanted Jesus to cast this demon out. And he tells her, he says, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Now he does end up helping this woman's daughter and casting the demon out. And there are other Gentiles that come to Jesus for help. But this prophecy about the Messiah says that the Gentiles sat in darkness and have seen a great light. Now, why would there be a prophecy about the Gentiles in with the Messiah if Jesus only came for the Jews. That's interesting to me. This very first prophecy that is mentioned by Matthew is about Gentiles and Jesus. But yet the focus should be on Jesus and the Jews, right? In John 10, 14 through 16, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. In other words, people who belong to me. Well, who did he come for? He came for the Jews, that's what he said. I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But I'll explain that here in just a minute. Because the bottom line is he did not only come for Jews. He came for both Jews and Gentiles. But in John 10, 14 through 16, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Well, who's the sheep? He's going he's gonna to say that. He's going to tell us who the sheep is. <clears throat> he says, I have other sheep too that are not of the sheepfold. So in other words, the sheep that he is referring to here are the Jews. But he says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So obviously here, Jesus was talking about the Jews, and then when he says there will, there's other sheep as well, he's talking about the Gentiles. Um, the main focus, and this is how my feeble attempt of explaining this is, is how it's going to go. The main focus for Jesus and his earthly ministry was the Jews. They are God's chosen people from the Old Testament, and God had made his covenant with the Jews, not, uh, not the Gentiles. There were Gentiles who were converted to Judaism in the Old Testament and in New Testament, and they were called proselytes. When the church began in Acts chapter 2, it started in the heart of, uh, of the Jewish nation or the Jewish race, if you will, in Jerusalem, right? In Acts chapter 2, they're there. Uh, all these Jews have gathered from all over the place. They've come back to Jerusalem to present their first fruits to God. So the church began right there in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles in Acts chapter 2. It was there in Jerusalem. And for years, the church stayed right there in Jerusalem until persecution began. And when the Christians left Jerusalem to escape the persecution, what are they going to take with them? They're going to take Jesus with them, and they're going to take the gospel with them, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And they're going into these Gentile cities that is outside of Jerusalem. But even then, these Jews who have been Christians for a quite a, a, a long time now, for years, uh, because the church just stayed right there in Jerusalem until this persecution came. And, and, and it's like God just crushed an anthill and the ants just scattered. 
Um, it's like God just took his foot and just crushed the church and said, get out. And, and so they, they, they scattered, just like Jesus said that they would uh, to his apostles in uh, Acts chapter 1 when he says, you'll be my witnesses unto, to me and to the Jews first and then to, uh, to Judea and to Samaria and to the other parts of the world. And so the Jews have the gospel. Jesus has died on the cross for sins of the Jews and the Gentiles, but for the longest time it's to the Jews only. They're in Jerusalem. And then because of persecution, it begins to scatter, and they're going into these Gentile cities carrying the message of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. They're carrying this message of hope to these Gentile areas. But here's the thing. When when uh, uh, in Acts chapter ten we have uh, we have God sending Peter this vision, uh, this sheet of these unclean animals, and and he, God saying Peter get up and kill and eat, and Peter saying No, I'm not doing that. That you told that those animals are unclean. I'm not eating what you've called unclean. I, I'm not I'm not sinning against you, God. And God says, Don't call unclean what I have called clean. And this happens three times to Peter, and Peter's scratching his head. He's like, what is going on here? What, what does this mean? And about that time, some people show up from Cornelius' house and invites Peter to Cornelius' house because they want to hear the gospel. They want to hear about Jesus. And so uh, Cornelius is Gentiles. And what Cornelius does in Acts chapter 10 is he goes and he gathers up family and friends, and he invites all these Gentile people to his house. Peter comes over. Tells them about Jesus, and before Peter could ever even get through his sermon or, or his speech or whatever he's telling them about Jesus, the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentiles just like it fell on Peter and the other apostles in Acts chapter 2. They begin speaking in tongues, and Peter and the Jews that were with Peter immediately recognize what is happening, and so they baptize uh, in water these Gentiles, and so now. The Gentiles have been welcomed into the church. Cornelius and his friends and his family, they were speaking in tongues. They've been baptized. And so Peter's putting it all together, and he says, Hey, God is now taking this message to the Gentile people. But uh, for the longest time, they still struggle. The Jews still struggle with God allowing the Gentiles in, and, it, and it's really a struggle the whole time that Paul is out there preaching to uh, the Gentiles, and, and it ends up getting him killed. Um, but in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21, it says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered be during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. So because of this persecution, the church is scattered. It goes into these Gentile cities, but they're still finding Jews and preaching to Jews. Then verse 20 says, however, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So in my feeble attempt at explaining this, to me, this is what that prophecy meant. The Gentiles have seen a great light. We know Jesus is the light of the world, John 8, 12, right? So they, the Gentiles have seen a great light, Jesus. He's the light of the world, and now they're hearing the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and what he has done for them, and they're being obedient, but remember what Jesus said. He says, I have sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them two, and they will be one flock. So now we have Jews and we have Gentiles hearing the gospel and obeying the gospel and worshiping God as one. And this is huge. Um, Paul says in Galatians 3, 26-29, he says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All, all of you are. Who's he talking to? All who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. 
So the people who have chose, they've heard the message of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and Paul or whoever was telling them the message, they, he says you need to be baptized for the remission of, or forgiveness of your sins. You need to be baptized in water. And so he says all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. But there is confirmation of what Jesus said. I've got sheep of another fold and and, and they're going to be welcomed into the kingdom as well. And they will, the Jews and the Gentiles will be one. And we see it in Acts chapter 10 in, in Cornelius' house with his friends and his family. They're, they're speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit has fallen on them. And they're baptized in water. And, and the Jews are, are now going into these Gentile cities. And they're, they're starting to tell the Gentile people about what Jesus has done. These Gentile people are being obedient to the gospel. They're being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. They're now worshiping with these Jews. And Paul says, you are all children of God through faith. All of you who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. And there is no longer Jew or Gentile, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Just as Jesus told his disciples, it would happen that these other sheep would be welcome into the fold and they will be one, the Jews and the Gentiles. And here's Paul saying, hey, you are all one. How? In Christ Jesus. And why do I spend so much time on this in this podcast? Because if you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. No matter what race you are, no matter what nationality you are, if you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. I am a Gentile. And God has chosen you, and he has chosen me, a Gentile, to be a part of his kingdom. And I say, thank you, Jesus, that we can be washed in the blood of Christ, that we can hear the gospel and be obedient to the gospel and be a part of the kingdom of God, and we can be on our way to heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. So, finishing up this podcast, just real quick talking about Jesus going out along the Sea of Galilee, and he's going to choose some of his disciples. And we're first told about Peter and Andrew, who are brothers. Uh, and they're out there fishing, and they're throwing their nets in the water. And we, it, so that means they're using nets and not poles. That means they're commercial fishermen, right? It's how they make a living. It's, it's how they took care of their families. And this is important because we know from Scripture that Peter was married. And so Jesus comes along, and he says, come follow me. And I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets and at once and they followed Jesus. Now, in my opinion, and I'm sure it would be your opinion too, this would take a huge amount of faith because Jesus is telling them to leave your way of making a living. Leave your paycheck. Leave your security. Put your family in my hands and trust me. And that, that's difficult. For anybody, even today, especially, I mean, they could see Jesus. They've heard about Jesus. His fame is beginning to spread. And so they, they, could, they could physically see Jesus. We can't today. We, we are literally going on faith. And, and, and so it, we're telling people, hey, leave your security and put your faith in this man that you can't even see. So we, we really have it extremely difficult. Yes, we have the Word. And yes, we have faith. But that's all we have to go on. Because Jesus ain't popping up and showing up and saying, Here I am. It's not going to happen. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's making intercession for us. He's done all that He has to do. He's, he's died on the cross for our sins. He's given us the message that's been passed down to us. We either hear it and believe it, or we hear it and reject it. Um, and so... This would be even more difficult, in my opinion, for us today. But but we have to do it if we want to go to heaven. We have to choose Jesus. And so Jesus tells these two disciples, these new disciples, he says, I'm going to show you how to fish for people. And I got to think about that. And I, I thought, well, why would anybody want to fish for people? Because, I mean, just think about people for a minute. If you've ever worked in the public or for the public, 
you know how people are. They can be mean. They can be selfish. People are that they only care about themselves. People can be hateful. I mean, people have good qualities too, but for the most part, people are just mean. People are people. Um, and to me, I, I would be thinking, okay, it's a, it would be a lot easier for, for me to stay in my boat and do my own thing. And I know a lot of you out there who are listening to me have the same attitude, especially since the pandemic happened because we got used to being alone. We got used to working alone. We, we got used to working from home. And you know, I, I talked to somebody the other day that, that said that they still, uh, even to this day, work in their pajamas and never leave home they, they they work in their living room um people you know we, we go to the grocery stores now we can order our food online our groceries online and we we pull up in the parking lot and we punch in on our phone that we've arrived and they bring the groceries out to us we don't even have to get out of our car for anything we can go to a restaurant to a drive through window and it's it's all this isolation and we've gotten used to this isolation and being alone over the past two years, we don't want to be around people. We don't. We, we watch church online. We don't go to the services anymore. Ever since COVID started, all, all churches' numbers are down because people got used to the convenience of watching the services online. We've gotten used to the isolation. We got used to being alone, and 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 so uh, we've gotten used to not being around people. And and now when you. I've noticed, like, I'm a big talker, and I don't meet a stranger. I, I talk to anybody, and I bring up any kind of thing in a conversation to anybody. And I've noticed that, you know, I'll, I'll say something to somebody when I'm working, and they walk by me, and, you know, and I'll start speaking to them, you know, just a friendly hello, how are you doing, or something like that. And they just look at me, and they, you know, with these big wide eyes, and like, why are you talking to me? Is it stranger danger? What should I do? I don't know what to say. I don't know how to interact with you because I haven't interacted with people for so long. I'm used to being by myself, right? And so Jesus tells these two commercial fishermen, he says, give up your comfort zone, guys. Give, give, give up your livelihood. Give up your way of making money. Give it all up and come with me. I'm going to make you fishers of people. And they, they did not hesitate. They left immediately. They just threw down their nets. They left their boat there on the shore, and they take off and follow Jesus. And here's the deal. If we want to get the gospel out there, we got to do the same thing. We we have to get out of our comfort zones and get involved with people. It, it, it's just the way it is. But it, it's not uh, easy to do, especially in today's time, because with social media and texting and just all these different things, we're just used to being alone. And we've gotten comfortable being alone. And so we got to get out of our comfort zones. And so Jesus walks down the shore a little ways, and there's two more brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Their dad is actually in the boat with them because they've got this family business going on. They've been fishing. Their nets are worn out. They've been torn up, so they're repairing their nets. And Jesus invites them to follow him, and, and they don't hesitate. They immediately leave the family business. They leave their dad with the ripped up nets. Then he can take, you know, he can fix the nets, take care of the nets. They leave everything that they have known all of their lives for what to follow a man who says he's the messiah who will travel the countryside like a nomad who don't even have a house he don't have a place to lay his head uh he, he's going to go from city to city preaching the kingdom of god has come and they're going to trade comfort uh for persecution i mean james in uh, i believe it was acts chapter 8 or acts chapter 9 uh, he's going to be beheaded. Uh, that's how bad the persecution uh, gets uh, at, at one point when the church is being persecuted in the book of Acts. But you know, I think they made the right decision. They left everything for Jesus. And, and, and God is asking us to do the same thing. To give up all that we know for him and to leave our comfort zones to 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 leave what we are used to and follow him to to put our our selfish desires our wants our our what we think are needs aside and and to put on 
Christ and to live for him and to do his will, whatever that may be. And, it, and it's not easy. But Jesus says, and we'll get there eventually, Matthew 16, 24 through 26, he tells his disciples, he says, if any of you, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And that's the question I'm going to end with on this podcast. Is there anything in your life that's worth missing heaven? Is there anything in your life that is more important than following Jesus and giving your life to the Messiah, Christ, who loved you enough to die on the cross for your sins and to be resurrected out of that tomb on the third day and ascend back to the Father and making intercession for you. What is worth saying no to Jesus for? Absolutely nothing. These men did not hesitate. They immediately left everything they knew and followed Jesus. And it says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went, people from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from east of the Jordan River. These four guys, because they said yes to Jesus when he said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. They said, yes, we'll leave it all behind and we'll follow you. And they got to witness all of this. We have it even better. We may not see Jesus physically. We may not get to see these healings and and these demons being cast out. But we have it far greater because we're going to get to see heaven someday. We will get to see Jesus face to face, and we will be with him for eternity only if we say yes to his invitation. He's saying, leave it all behind. Leave your comfort zone and put me first in your life. Are you willing to do that today? Are you willing to give your life to Jesus Christ? You say, well, Randy, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I say, well, that's great. But is he first in your life? And if, if he is first in your life, are you telling others about him are you out of your comfort zone and doing his will or are you in your comfort zone doing your will he says what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul is there anything worth more than your soul and i hope the answer for you is nothing is worth losing my soul over make jesus first in your life if you haven't today god bless you thank you for listening today and keep grinding Thank you for listening to the Grinded Podcast today. May God bless you. If you have any comments or questions, you can email them to us at thegrinditpodcast at gmail.com. If you would like Randy to come and speak at your church or your next event, you can contact him through that same email address. Also, I would like to thank Jody Foster's Army, also known as JFA, for their song, Abba, as we use for our intro and our outro off their untitled 1984 album. May God bless you, and remember, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep grinding.